Welcome to the Salem Athenaeum, everyone. I'm Diane Stern with a quick program reminder that this Friday, we have an online salon. Emery Jones discusses Daniel Defoe's A Journal of the Plague Year, 1722, and of course, with the backdrop of COVID-19. Uh, it starts at five, a little earlier than usual, because he's in London where he lectures at King's College. And a week from Friday, July 31st, a Salem Literary Festival online fundraiser with Issa Leshko, an author and photographer, who will discuss her book, Allowed to Grow Old, Portraits of Elderly Animals from Farm Sanctuaries. So you can uh, reserve your spot at actually any of the programs at salemathenaeum.net. Now to our special guest, who we've been trying to bring to the Athenaeum for over a year, but <laughs> scheduling conflicts and a move back to her native Ohio got in the way. Dr. Deborah Plummer's presentation tonight happens to coincide with the national and global outrage at this year's murders of George Floyd and others by police. There are protests against policing, offensive names of sports teams and Confederate symbols. We're taking second looks at the lives of famous Americans just today in the LA Times. You may or may not have seen this, but we learned that the father of national parks, John Muir, was a racist. His descriptions of African Americans and Native Americans are beyond offensive. I won't say what they were. Tonight's guest, a psychologist and university professor, has spent decades researching issues surrounding equality, inclusion, and mutual respect. Her latest book is Some of My Friends Are, The Daunting Challenges and Untapped Benefits of Cross-Racial Friendships. Tonight, we'll learn about achieving racial equity, quality, make that one friend at a time. Please welcome Deborah Plummer. Why, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to begin, and you're probably wondering why I'm starting this presentation with the back of a horse or a horse's ass is your big picture here. And it's because it reminds me of a story of an out-of-towner who accidentally drives his car into a deep ditch on a side of a country road. And luckily for the farmer, uh, a, a farmer happened to, the driver, a farmer happened to go by and with his old horse named Benny. And the man asked for help. And the farmer said that Benny could help him pull that car out. So he backed Benny up and hitched Benny to the man's car bumper. Then he yelled, pull, Nellie, pull. And Benny didn't move. Then he yelled, come on, pull, Roger, pull. And still Benny didn't pull. Then he yelled real loud, now pull, Buster, pull. And Benny just stood. Then the farmer nonchalantly said, okay, Benny, pull. And Benny pulled the car out of the ditch. And the man was amazed. He was also very appreciative, but wondered, it was really curious though, and so he wondered why um, the farmer had called the horse by the wrong name three times and asked him why. And the farmer said, Benny is blind. And if he thought he was the only one pulling, he wouldn't even try. Now, I know that in this time, in this age, I wake up every morning, a black woman, yep, checking, still black, you know, and it has its challenges, particularly now, but I know I'm like Benny, if I knew I was the only one trying to work for racial equity, if I knew that I was the only one pulling, you know, I wouldn't even try. So I am so grateful to all of you who have joined in this conversation this evening. You know, I know even with um, a pandemic and trying to social distance, there are lots of choices for things to do. So I am very grateful for you for um, tuning in, you know, for this presentation today. And I especially want to thank um, Diane for um, our conversations over the year, <laughs> trying to, you know, make this work. And I want to thank Carolyn to also to, for 
um, helping to get this um, presentation for tonight. You know, I I'm truly am inspired by um, and always have been by the work of John Lewis. And as we commemorate his life and um, his as a civil rights icon, and I think about him too when I think about like with the horse with Benny. And again, if if he weren't pulling and trying and fighting hard and getting into good trouble, as he called it, you know, um, you know, I wouldn't be trying even, even as well. So I am a cross-racial friendship activist, which means that I work and promote cross-racial friendships as a sure path to reducing our ever-widening racial divide that is really affecting the quality of all of our lives. And I want to share with you my journey to this discovery and invite you to explore the potential of your own cross-racial friendships to heal the racial divide. That is, if you have any, you know, most of us don't. I want you to think for a moment about white Americans. You know, white Americans generally have about 91% of the people in their social networks are white to share the same racial identity. Here's some more confirming data. 83% of African Americans of, uh, of people in their social networks are black. 64% of Latinx Americans or approximately two thirds of the people in their social networks are Latinx. And 54% of Asians reported that their close friends are Asians and also American Indians, other racial groups we know form a similar pattern in the sense that they claim little in common, you know, with those who don't share their racial background. You know, simply put, all of us are racial isolationists to some extent. You know, and why is that important? You know, I wanna tell you how I got to the journey of studying this. Many years ago now, you know, and I'm back in Cleveland, so I'm, I walk, I'm still walking with my friend, Devon, who lives here. And I was on one of these walks one day, and this was um, probably, let's see, gosh, at least 20 years ago now. And Yvonne and I on our walks, like I'm sure like many of you who walk with your friends, solve the world's problems. You know, by the time we, you know, finish our walk, you know, we've stopped, we have answers for world peace, you know, all of those kind of big things. So we were on one of these walks and having one of these kinds of conversations when she said to me, I don't know what it was that prompted it, but she said, why do you have so many white friends? And I thought that was a strange question. So I said to her, you don't have, you know, white friends because we share a similar background, you know, um, in, our, in our growing up. And I thought, okay. Um, so the, being the academic that I am, I became very curious about her um, statement. And I decided I was going to do some research to prove her to be the outlier. You know. So I began doing focus groups and administering friendship surveys, which I still do today, to explore the, um, the patterns of adult cross-racial friendships. And guess what? You know, I found out that I was the outlier and that, as I said, most of us don't have friends that cross racial lines. I used in my research, what I started with, I used, and this was, um, you may remember, the, those of you who um, remember this ad, it was a long time ago, it was called Jennifer's Sofa. And I used to have a laminated um, big copy of that picture, which I would take to my focus groups. It looked something like this. I since threw away that laminated um, ad, but I wish I, I couldn't find it anymore today and I wish I had saved it. But it had a, a group of beautiful young people like this picture here sitting on a sofa. And Jennifer's sofa ad was one that was, um, it was a sofa bed in um, convertible bed. And the idea was that you can invite all of your friends over and they, you, you know, we, you have this wonderful sofa bed. And so I, um, it was very popular ad at the time. So I took this and I would say, okay, which does your group of friends look like Jennifer's sofa or does it look like you remember, might remember this program that is still out, you know, it still 
had a reunion show of called Friends, where three men, three young men and three young women of the BFF kind, you know, live in the same apartment complex and face, and um, they go through all kinds of um, issues and face love and challenges in New York City. You know, um, this was a popular show um, that aired for 10 years from 1994 to 2004, which was the time when I was starting to do um, a lot of the deep research. So I said, does your friend, does your group look like Jennifer Sofa or does it look like Friends or does it look like this um, picture, which is Living Single of the cast of Living Single, 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 easy for me to say, not tonight, I guess. Um, this was the show, which was six black 20 something year olds, again, four men and two women who share their lives and love, similar story in a Brooklyn brownstone, you know. Um, they, this was a popular show among the black community, particularly that aired from 1993 to 1998, you know, which sparked the controversy because this show actually started before Friends, you know, that um, they were taking a popular show and making it even more popular by just changing the cast, you know, and making them all white. Now, for me, you know, this was, I was curious because again, yeah, this did sh show you, you know, and of course, most people said that their friendship patterns either looked like friends or live in single, but not like Jennifer Sofa. So why is it so hard for us to form friendships across racial lines? Because that's going to give us a peek into how systemic racism, how structural racism, how interpersonal racism, and even modern forms of racism play out in our everyday lives. One, you know, at the time, and I think even more so now, but we have gotten a huge wake up call with George Floyd, you know, that our nation is suffering from race fatigue. You know, we're tired of hearing about white privilege, you know, and white fragility, you know, we're unconscious bias, microaggressions, racial stamina, modern racism, all of these things. And then what I also know is that we don't have a shared understanding or a collective understanding about these terms. I do a, a a, a webinar called Understanding Racism 101. And it's become very popular, of course, since in, um, in recent times. In fact, I just did it last week or this week and I had over 700 people were on the, on, on the webinar. Because people are now eager to get that kind of shared understanding, but I know we don't have a shared understanding and we clearly don't have a shared understanding of uh, the American experience around race. You know. Um, what it means to be white in America is different from what it means to be a person of color. And because our worlds are so separated, it makes it hard to understand the racial gaps that exist in wealth, health, prison sentences, education, and employment. Again, it's hard because of other factors as well. The first is our brain on diversity. You know, um, our brain has to work very hard to overcome all of those social loadings that we get in our brain. And I'm not gonna, that's another whole course, another whole webinar about the brain on diversity. But suffice it to say that we, when we don't have the competencies that we need, what happens is that we end up having that amygdala hijack where it goes to the emotional center of the brain and then we freeze, we have that go into the fight or flight response that you probably remember from psychology 101, you know, where you're either going to um, fight about it because it's a fear, you're going to push against it, or you're going to just run away, you know, and that's what happens. So we need to start to learn how to manage race as um, a, and it's not as a threat to be feared, but as a challenge to be mastered. And I'm not saying that the race itself is a challenge. I'm saying that we have to get our competencies, learn the competencies in terms of the dynamics of differences and why I am so convinced that friendships across racial lines are like a living laboratory for us in learning that. You know. So psychological factors. You know, we have a preference for those who look like us, talk like us, think like us, 
act like us. Of course, they're wonderful people, you know. And so that we're tribal people and that um, we know friendships are optional. And so it's going to play into how we choose something, you know. And most of us also, too, don't um, want to, are scared. We're scared and because we don't want to disrupt a relationship. So we're scared to say the wrong thing because we don't want to hurt p other people. And so that makes it harder than, especially in a cross-racial friendship, if you don't have those competencies. You know. Cultural encapsulation and spatial racism. You know, we live apart and we have limited contact with those who are different races outside of work settings. You know, and spatial races, racism, if you haven't heard that term, that is one that, um, where we have racially and economically segregated um, patterns that exist in most um, cities. And I can tell you it exists a lot in Massachusetts and particularly in the Boston area. Um, we have a lot of um, economically and racially segregated patterns. Personal choice, as I said before, you know, um, friendships are optional. Optional. Most of our um, us are very busy people, you know, with very little discretionary time for socializing. And so, if it's going to be work to socialize and be in a friendship, it's it's hard. And um, so, we just don't do it. And then demographic challenges. You know, um, we know that there are right now at least two whites for every person of color and so many persons of color you know um end up being the friend you know for that person who is white uh, and it doesn't even go in terms of that way for distribution and then the other thing is the challenge of empathy this is a picture of hog get you know and you might be familiar with this story um, and remember, this is the terrier dog that was stranded along with 11 other survivors on the ship after a fire broke out in the engine room of an oil tanker. And this happened in 2002, you know. And the ship was adrift uh, and got within 220 miles outside of Hawaii. You know. And when they spotted, when they were spotted by a cruise ship, the crew was rescued, but poor Hoggett was accidentally left behind. And then Ho the Hawaiian Humane Society at the time set out to rescue him. And soon media reports began to appear. And actually donations from 39 states and four foreign countries came in. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm again talking about how I get in this thing. Well, two principles here apply for hear about er how eradicating racism happens. And one is the diffusion of responsibility. You know, anytime we have a massive issue, it's too big for one person to do something about them, you know, then we diffuse the responsibility. And race, racism is so big that people say, oh, I can't do anything about it, you know. And the telescope effect. And that is that we are best able to respond when we are focused on a single victim. In this case, case Hoggett. You know, so people are like, well, you know, look at all these, uh, it's a dog, you're trying to rescue a dog. And, you know, we have all these other pets here. We got all these shelters that are, you know, have all these animals on it. What's up with this, you know? And it's, I, those two apply, you know. In other words, it was too big, you know, it, it, it's too big to try to rescue every dog, you know, and that's why, we, so we have a diffusion of responsibility, but we could rescue Hoggett and people could, rally around how get well it's the same thing in terms of having friends of different races race race races what happens is when we do have a friend of a different race it makes racism real i want to talk about that a little bit more you know in this piece right now what we what how we tend to look at race and other dimensions of diversity uh, and human differences we tend to to have going right now what I call a dominance model versus a relational model. And when you think about a dominance model, think about an hourglass, you know. When we have an hourglass like the one I have here, you know, um, what happens is that when we have the, from a dominance model, whoever is in the up position 
of that dimension of diversity would get to make all the rules, policies, practices, procedures, you know, they're the ones who control, they get to even mess on other, you know. So in this case, for human differences, it's race, it would be white people and people of color. But you can apply the same principle about the dominance model to, you know, men over women, you know, um, um, heterosexual people over LGBTQ people. You could go down the list, you know, wealthy people over, you know, people um, who don't have, you know, poor or poverty, you know, classism, you know, um, all of the dimensions of diversity could do that. And so when you're dealing with a dominance model and you have fear attached, what, what people get concerned about is that you, all that's going to happen is flip, you know, and that's what's happening now. You know, when you're dealing from a fear perspective that basically, you know, whites were, you know, in the majority, so they, they're the ones who get the rules and now we're just going to flip it and people of color are going to be, do that, you know. And so we're, this tug of war gets placed there. From a relational perspective, what we're trying to do is to, to lay that baby like this, you know, so that it's a level playing field. And actually just even to break the glass, you know, so we don't have those boundaries. Because as human beings, it's our core identity as a human speaking to another's core identity as a human. And that's what happens in those friendships. What I discovered in the research, again, is that there are several factors that lead to why uh, um, why we don't, again, make friends across racial line. Parental influence is one, you know, children don't tend to see their parents with friends of different race, and they learn this early, and there are studies that show that the children, the same child who would grow up in a home and would be upset with their parents if they didn't let um, the, a, a friend of a different race come for a sleepover, you know, and they would get mad at their parents, that same child, when he grows up and, he, and the parents won't allow them to date that friend of a different race, says, understands. So there's something, again, happening in our society around that. Gender. Men tend to have more cross-racial friends, believe it or not, than women. But women tend to have more depth. In other words, more intimacy. They're closer. So they may have one or two or three, one or two. But those are closer friends. You know, men tend to just have, you know, um, what we call like on their depth of intimacy, it's not that high. Education, the less education you have, then there are a number of factors that you need in order to have a friend that cross racial lines or the probability. Similar values, careers, geographic proximity, social class, you know, all have to line up. That's a lot of things that need to line up. If you, uh, have higher education, there's only two things that um, come together, shared values and social class. Other than that, you know, it's, it's easy to make a friend across racial lines. Generational differences, as far as age is concerned, we found that cross-racial friendships across all generations with millennials and Generation Z, those are the folks that have been born, you know, since 2000, you know, have diverse friends as more of a normative experience and are more conscious of their multiple and intersecting identities. So they don't see race the same way that perhaps, you know, um, baby boomers and traditionalists, you know, um, um, would. Happiness and woke, you know, happiness, if you have cross-racial friends, you tend to be happier, but it also makes you more aware of racial discrimination. Yeah. Context is also important. You know, all cross-racial friends highlight the influence of the social, historical, and political context in shaping these friendships. There's, they just do, naturally. But we also know that all cross-racial friends are not equal. You know, that although all cross-racial friendships give witness to racial harmony and the potential for racial harmony, not all cross-racial friendships lessen the racial divide. I want to talk about why that's so. In my book, I talk about five different kinds of cross-racial friendships. And if you read the book, thank you, because then you remember this part. You know, 
The first is what I call the bubble cross-racial friends. And these are the cross-racial friends that live in racial utopia, where the, um, the white is unaware of their self as a racial person, and the, political, um, the person of color is kind of a race neutral. You know, they, a person who happens to be black or happens to be Latinx or happens to be Asian, you know. And so they both share the same similarities and they enter these friendships with ease, you know. The, but, but they're kind of sometimes token friends for each other. Oh, I have a black friend or I have a white friend, you know. Um, and they're not really friends of that depth because they deny the lived experience of what's happening in the context. Then there are fantasy friends, you know, which have very little contact and no depth of intimacy, you know, but I found in my studies that most people claim, you know, that they have cross-racial friends just because they know intuitively, intuitively that it's probably, you know, socially warranted in a morally enlightened society and it's the right thing to have. So they'll um, say, yes, I do, and then when, you ask them further questions about that friendship. You know, they don't really know much. It's the, the person who sits two pews back on from them, you know, at the place where they worship, or it's the, you know, coworker that they were on a United Way team with 10 years ago, or it's the Pomeranian's dog mom. You know, they don't even know the name. They just know it's Pomeranian dog's mom, you know, the neighbor down there. That's what those, those are fantasy friends. As one woman always said, well, she says, well, Oprah's my friend. You know, of course, Oprah Winfrey's everybody's friend. So it's got to be friends. Those are fantasy friends. You know, calendar friends are, these are people who are actually real. You know, they're part of your group of friends, but um, you're connected with them through shared experience experience, maybe like work or um, something else, but then you just go out with them typically recreational. So you, I call them calendar friends because maybe you go with them once a month or they're in your book club or you see them at a, a, a function that you attend with. So they don't really have the depth, but you do know them and, and they're there. The fellowship and the friends of the hearts are the ones that can really help to move the mountains of racism because they do have depth, depth of intimacy. The um, fellowship friends are the ones that are forged working on mutual goals for social justice, or maybe achieving a mission and a business objective. You're working together with this individual. You share a lot, you know, and perhaps even some private things. But generally then when the goal is accomplished, you know, you may still continue the friendship and thought of, but the friendship doesn't continue, I mean, but you think of them fondly. I think about the woman who was my manicurist for 20 years, you know, a, a white woman. And, she, you know, we shared everything. That was like my weekly therapy session for her. It was like her weekly therapy. We knew more about each other's family and lives and um, relationships than I think a lot of people, you know, <laughs> a lot of me, my really close friends did. You know, she, w and, and we shared a lot of similar values, but I haven't seen her you know, it's when, it's when I moved in 2010 to Boston area, you know, um, I didn't see her after that, you know, because the relationship was gone because the, you know, the connection was gone there. Would I call her a friend? Yes. You know, did she know? Could we talk about race relations all the time? You know, could we talk about those hard topics? Absolutely. Fellowship, though. The diff so you take all those factors and put them with the, um, the friend of the heart. And these are the ones that share depth and intimacy. There, you know, it's not just for something that's tying you together that's outside of this. This is These are the people that I call your 3 a.m. friends, the people you could call at three in the morning if you were in emotional distress. You know, you work through your racial identity resolution process together. You've socialized in each other's home. You may have vacation together. You know, you could borrow money. You could witness a family argument. And as one focus group participant said to me, this is the kind of friend that I could do a number two in their bathroom. <laughs> So what's the benefit of having a cross-racial friend? I look at it as when you're traveling through life, you know, with a friend of a different race, whites get to see that when the spikes do not come down for people of color and, and they work for a level playing field. You know, if you ever had the experience of um, renting a car, as I have many times, and there's those spikes like that for when you're returning the car and it says, that ominous sign that says if you're going in the wrong direction, that you're going to have tire damage, and it always makes me nervous. But when you go across it, those spikes just lie right down. 
and and for whites, you know, and when you're in privilege, social privilege, you know, you're just going through life, and that's what privilege does. It's like those spikes are lying down, you know. Now, people of color, you know, have to figure out how to get that car around those spikes, and that's what you know racism is about because it's there. It also means that you know um, if you do happen to go on the and on the spike and it ruins your tire, you know, the, you can be pretty sure if you're white that the rental company is going to take care of, you know, the damage. And if you're a person of color, that's not the case, you know. So I'm using that metaphor to say then, when we travel the, you know, the world with a friend of a different race, we get to see when those spikes lie down or when they stay up. And you can have those kinds of conversations. I certainly have had them all the time with my friends who are white. I tell the story in the book too about a close friend of mine, Peggy, who lives in Columbus. We went to graduate school together. And so when we're, I'm in Columbus for travel, you know, I, um, we get together. And it was one, one of those times when we were sitting in a restaurant and, you know, we were just talking, talking away. So, you know, as you do when you reunite with somebody who you, you're very close to. And didn't even notice that we, it was sometime before we were getting served. And so at a, after a minute, she, you know, kind of, she, after a while, she looked around and said, you know what, we haven't gotten served. And you know what, we don't even have any bread. She goes, look at her, she goes, we didn't even get any bread. She goes, ah, it's because of you. Every time I'm with you, this happens, you know, because it was the only person in, the, the only person of color in this restaurant. We had a good laugh over that you know, truly, because we are close and can understand that. But I was, you know, I was thinking, okay, she got a dose of that. And the piece was, we had no idea whether it was, you know, it was proven that because I was black, but it was nevertheless, she could see how the world operates, you know, um, with that. So um, I could say a lot more about that, but I am not, I'm gonna move on so that we can get some question and answer in here. Um, what are some of the benefits then? You know, prejudice and stereotype reduction. You know, changes cultural or cultural beliefs. It reduces racial isolation in communities. We have a better informed citizenry. You know, think about what's happening right now with the Confederate um, flags and um, Confederate flags and the statues, et cetera. You know, most people don't understand that m the majority, if not all of those statues were erected in the 1950s around the time for Jim Crow, you know, when, there was, um, when they were trying to make a statement about racism. It was really racist and not just slavery, you know. Confederate flag is that symbol. You know, I talk about in the story in the book when my, when my um, parents, moved, you know, I, I was a high school student and we moved from Cleveland, um, a sub uh, of Cleveland to a rural area, right? 30 miles outside of Cleveland, Huntsburg, on a six acre lot that my parents had owned and they decided to build a house on there. And when they did, the neighbors next door who had moved from a suburb of Cleveland because blacks were moving into that suburb, irony of that, we moved right next door to them. So they erected a barbed wire fence the whole length of our, our lot, and then put no trespassing signs around, but hung a, a Confederate flag you know, there. All, every day, hung a Confederate flag. Now that story ended up with a, you know, with a good ending after many years, but nevertheless, it was a symbol. It was a symbol that you're not wanted. It was a symbol about racism, it was a symbol that was there. So, um, we, but we get a better informed citizenry when we understand what these things and the impact on someone else. An expanded embrace of global citizenship, the improved um, team and performance and innovation in organizations. So there's a lot of mutual benefits, you know, and people of color and whites, you know, whites have a lot of work to do in terms of understanding themselves as a racial being and around race relations. You know, we have uneven experiences about it, but people of color also have work to do. So we have independent work and we have collective work, you know, and clearly, you know, when you are in a friendship with those who are uh, someone across racial line, particularly that, like I said, the ones of the fellowship or of the heart, you know, 
you, you can make really good progress. So what's the way forward? You know, what are some skills that we have to learn and practice? We have to know, and these are again, what we learn in cross-racial friendships, how to hold multiple realities, identities, and perspectives. These are your basic um, diversity competencies for living and managing well in a multiracial world, multicultural world, how to marry intention and impact, you know, because intention doesn't always mitigate impact. You know, if I were to look, you know, somehow um, get to you, wrestle you to the ground and put my foot on your neck, but then look down at you lovingly and say, gee, you look like such a nice person. I would really like to get to know you. You know, which one would you pay more attention to? You know, my foot, your foot, my foot on your neck, you know, or my words, you know. So intention doesn't always mitigate impact and we have to be able to marry those two. How to move from certainty to curiosity. That's one that we really need today. And, you know, we can be so certain, you know, about something and not even question it. And there's so much we have to question today. One of my friends, you know, his white was talking about just coming from a, a you know, social distance party and they were talking about you know, um, things like race relations because of what's happened to George Floyd. There was a whole white group, she is white. And she said, you know, they were got to talking about the Confederate um, statues. And she says, and, and after she had explained because, you know, that, you know, um, you know, about some of the history behind the thing, we said, well, I get that. But then she said, but then one of the women said, but what about Christopher Columbus? What did he do? He didn't do anything. Why would we want to, you know, because in Cleveland here, it's a big thing because they're taking down one of the statues in Little Italy. Why would they want to take down his statue? Okay, you know, moving from certainty to curiosity, if you're so certain and so sure, especially because our history, um, you know, it was is told and omits and it's misguided in so many ways. Um, if you read Ibram Kendi's work, you know, stamped from the beginning, you know, um, it really um, helps to put it in perspective. If you read Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of the Other Sons, um, uh, Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman, those are all really good books that really start to, you know, um, re, now it's not, it's not revisionist history, it's just making it complete and telling the full story. Understanding social privilege as a life skill, we all, you know, have that, you know, privilege that comes from, you know, either um, with whiteness it comes, you know, with class it comes from me, it comes from me with, you know, education, you know, but it works the same way and we have to be able to use our privilege as a life skill. In other words, to know the other side of the dollar bill, not just our side, and to use that privilege um, as a life skill and not a power get, um, grab. And then how to make quality decisions in the midst of diversity tension, because anytime there's diversity, there's gonna be tension, but we can make that creative tension and that's what friendships do. Here's some actions to take. Knowing um, a racial identity, self-awareness, that's what's happening now for a lot of white folks. I also have a um, racial identity self-assessment tool that is on my website in the resource page at Muse. I'm getting ready to revise it and put it into an online format, which will make it easier to take, along with the anti-racist style indicator that's coming out in next month. And those are free tools that anybody can take and do, so I hope you use them. Um, making lifestyle choices leading to multiracial living. What do I mean by multiracial living? You know, it means where you choose to live, where you choose to, you know, um, to work, but even more so, you know, the choices that you make about what organizations you support, how you vote, um, how you, um, who you buy services from, who you choose to believe and not believe. There are many ways you can do multiracial living, you know, even if you can't move or if you, even if you're in Massachusetts, which is, you know, only has like 8% you know, black and 5% of them are in Boston, you know, you can still, you know, engage in multiracial living. Acknowledging and eradicating racism by being an anti-racist, you know, I would highly recommend um, Ivan Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And as I said, I have an um, a anti-racist style indicator tool coming out and some articles also on that. Understanding unconscious bias and implicit stereotypes, I would recommend, again, there's the implicit association test that anyone can take. You can go right online and do that. It's all, and that's, that's out of Harvard. 
um, just, you know, um, Google IAT, put IAT in, or come up, the implicit association test. You, you can take that, it's wonderful insights into your own thinking and behavior and empathy. Because remember when we talked about the, the challenge of empathy is that we, we, you know, we can't diffuse that responsibility. We have to start to see ourselves as part of that picture. And we can't, you know, and having a friend of a different race, that telescope um, scopic effect will say, okay, I can't do that because, you know, they have, you know, I have this friend and if they hurting that friend, they're hurting me, you know, just like when I, I stand up for LGBT rights, it's like, you know, I have to be able to say, if you're going to hurt them, you're coming through me, you know, because that's what that's about. And the same thing, if you have a friend of a different race and you're white, you're saying, hey, you know, it may not um, impact me, you know, um, personally, but it, I'm benefiting from, you know, um, how racism, structural racism and systemic racism, particularly, you know, um, is structured in our country. And so I, I don't like that, you know, and if I have a friend of race, I don't want to see that person, you know, be disadvantaged. So what's our end game here for all of this? How do we achieve racial equity again, one friend at a time, you know, the end game, what do we end up with? A healthy racial identity resolution process and becoming more fully and wonderfully authentic. You no, know, I always like think about the onion as a, a way to understand ourselves as human beings, you know, because onions has all those layers. And many times we act out of that layer and, unless that stem of the onion, that core. And when we're in friendships, it's core speaking to core. You know, you know when you're in that kind of relationship with somebody, you know, it's not, you know, it's not the layers. Or even if they do act out of their layers, you're like, okay, that's a layer, you know. But it's core speaking to core. So we're more fully and wonderfully authentic when core is speaking to core. The elimination of persistent racial gaps in wealth, health, prison sentences, education, and employment, you know, because people are likely to more set up policies and practices and procedures, you know, and vote in ways that will benefit all. A level playing field with access and opportunity for all. So we're leveling that playing field, breaking that glass. So we're not treating differences and the dynamics of differences as a threat to be feared, but we're treating it as a challenge to be mastered by developing competencies and skill sets to successfully na navigate our increasingly multicultural, multiracial world. We're doing multiracial living patterns with where we choose to live, who we buy services from, how we vote, what organizations we support and promote, who, um, who we have within our circle of influence, who we receive our information from, and who and what we choose to believe. And if we do those multiracial living patterns, we will reflect our diverse and inclusive society. And then lastly, a peaceful, diverse communities comprised of engaged, informed citizenry, that leverages diversity to contribute to a just and equitable society. That's our end game. You know, when I first did this slide and I put up the, um, I, I was looking for a picture of end game and I put it, uh, you know, I put an end game and then this, uh, this picture came up because I, I, you know, I kept trying to wonder because I'm not, what is that from one of those superhero movies or whatever, you know? Um, and so <laughs> I was like, okay, I learned something, you know, because <laughs> by wearing that. So racial equity takes place one cross-racial friend at a time. You know, cross-racial friendships that foster intergroup contact remain one of the most effective methods of improving racial race relations. They are successive approximations towards that goal of becoming the beloved community that Martin Luther King talked about. It brings us closer to a shared American experience, moving us from separate and equal and unequal to together and equal. Cross-racial friendships, especially those of the heart, reduce bias and change cultural beliefs, not just for that individual friendship, but really they hold the potential for, ch for positive change for their families and their circle of friends. You know, I don't know how many stories I've heard about that. And over time, these friendships then have profound effects on healing the divisions of the different racial groups and fostering racial equity. And we know that. So thank you so much.
I would love in any time remaining that we have to do some questions and have a conversation a bit as much as we can. Yes, and uh, people, uh, audience, uh, feel free to use the chat feature on this Zoom. I think probably you all know where that is if you have a question. Who would like to start us off? I'm going to stop share now so I can see everyone too. Oh, good. Also. It, Debbie, uh, on, a, on a personal level, um, I know that you have a lot of uh, faith in cross-racial friendships, but how do you see the current climate uh, where finally more white people seem to be engaged in trying to fix racial disparities. I mean, did it take this awful, well, that and others, I was thinking George Floyd, but I mean, is, is that what it takes, more horrific murders to jolt white people into action or into sympathy, empathy? Yeah. Well, you know, and that's a really good question because, you know, we don't know in this, this, this world of uncertainty and ambiguity and, you know, um, this, is, this is what we are in for the future between, you know, race relations and also the pandemic. And so the plan and predict kind of models of how change works, does, is, you know, we can't draw on that. But I do believe that... Um, empathy, you know, only happens, we know this also from research, when somebody has at least a shared experience, you only have empathy for somebody who can relate to in some way. Mm -hmm. So that's why the friendship part is important. But I do um, know, and having been in this space of diversity, equity, and inclusion for so long, that when we started, you know, and those, you remember the 60s, like the, the 70s and the 80s, and the time of the civil rights movement, um, the, the diversity training methods was what we used to call the C um, um, kind of approach, S-E-E, -E, and it stood for significant emotional event. So you tried to give someone, you know, a significant emotional event in the session that would jar them and then they would, you know, say, oh my gosh, I didn't know this, you know, or, and, or, or those things that would shame people and blame them you know, until they would, you know, just say, oh, we're such a terrible people. And I, I agree with Brene Brown, who says, you know, that shame is not a social justice tool. It just isn't, you know, because what happens is when you remove yourself from that shaming um, environment or shame thing, you just go back to, you know, what it was. So the significant emotional event piece is somewhat what happened with George Floyd. But here's where I think there's a difference. You know, because it wasn't, first of all, it wasn't fabricated in a training session. You know, secondly, um, it was out there for everyone to see. And George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd gave systematic racism a face. And systemic racism doesn't generally have, it doesn't, you know, structural racism and, um, and systemic racism doesn't have a um, identifiable, um, it, identifiable individual perpetrator, you know, because it's in systems, it's in history, it's in policies. But what happened with George Floyd was that people um, could see systemic racism because you had an officer, Derek Chauvin, who gave face to systemic racism with his knee on the neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. You had a 17-year-old girl um, videotaping, you know, the, the, the incidents with her phone, who really is suffering, of course, a lot from PTSD today. She's 17 years old, you know. You had EMT, work, uh, any team EMT worker um, asking, multiple times could she take his pulse. You had three other officers, you had people around. You see what I'm, you go, you see where I'm headed, you know, that you couldn't, and people yet couldn't do anything. Why? Because systemic racism was in place, you know, uh, and so people saw it and they were collectively horrified by it, you know, and so it, it did propel people. It was that significant emotional event for all of us. It, you know, and because of where we are right now, White said, 
you know, I don't want to have to deal with it. You know, I mean, people of color said, I, I'm no longer committed to white people's comfort in this, you know. Um, if they don't get it now, you know, I'm not going to try to do their work for them. Mm -hmm. And white people got that message and said, okay, let me go find some books. Let me go have some white, white caucus groups. Let me go do this. You know, I have all my friends, all my many white friends who I love, you know, they were calling me or trying to, and then they would know because I just said, I'm done. I'm done. You know, you have to do this work. You know, one of my dear former neighbors from, you know, when I lived here before, knocked on my door and just said, uh, I, 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 I just had to come. I just wanted to, to apologize or something. Uh, I didn't know what to do. You know, um, you know, I, I, she, she, she was trying to make up an excuse for why she was there, especially in the pandemic. It was like, I said, oh, just come on in. You know, we'll just, you know, stay six feet away from me, but we're going to, we can talk this out because she was so dis, you know, distraught. But they are looking to say, what can we do, you know? And I, I love that energy and I love that spirit at the same time. I hope it's sustainable because I'm old enough to see the wave of, you know, Robert Terry with his book, you know, um, what was it, you know, um, Four Whites Only, which of course I read, you know, um, because it was Four Whites Only, you know, but, you know, and he had the same blueprint like White Fragility has a little, you know, a little bit more academic then you had tim wise who came out with white like me and now you know a night now white fragility that people are running for but you know we'll see you know because i like i said i've seen the waves but we'll see but something about this seems to me to stick and why i think it's because we have younger generational folks you know when i was out protesting you know in terms of the black Lives matter movement i saw just as many white people you know, we got there early because we wanted to social distance and we, you know, and we also didn't want to get there. But there were so many white people there. I was like, whoa, look at this, you know, <laughs> look at all these white people, you know. <laughs> and that's a good thing. I didn't see that, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s when I, you know, was out there, you know. So I think there's a difference now. I think people, it, it is, like I said, the success of approximations to the goal. You get a little deeper, you get a little deeper. And I and I hope that the that people are reading and going deeper about racial identity and resolution and what it's about. We're all learning about what systemic racism is. Like like I you know like I said, um, you know we have to have some shared language because this has happened for you know we've been doing messing up for four hundred years. This is the way it's been for four hundred years, and now we're trying to take this crash course on it. You know all these organizations that call me and they want to do something in two weeks. I said. So I'll take a deep breath. You know, it's been this way for 400 years. I can't rush in there and fix it in two weeks for you, you know. And the fact that, you know, whites are trying to take a crash course on it. You know, people of color trying to do a refresher course or, or too embarrassed to say, I didn't know that. You know, I didn't know what those things are about, you know, is either. So we're all in this, you know, trying to learn. And I, I love that. I think uh, it's, it's also hopeful with the millennials and the uh, Generation Z that they, it, 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 they just seem to be in a much better place. Absolutely. And you more, know, yeah. More they have more cross-racial friendships. Yes. Too. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know, I, I did um, focus groups on millennials with millennials and focus groups on Generation Z, you know, and I can tell you the Generation Z folks, for some of my questions, I was, they were looking at me like I ate babies for breakfast. It was like, what's she talking about? You know? And then they had one, one woman who I, you know, one young woman who was about, she was about 17 years old. And um, she became like the translator for them, you know, because, and you know, these, they didn't know each other, but they're like, look around, then they look at her and then she would, then she kind of look at me and go, well, we think it's just, you know, or I just think, like I would say, well, do you do different things with your friends of different races or whatever? Or suppose your friend of a different race, you know, um, needs this. And she would go, they would go, uh, you just do something else. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and really then after I would, you know, cause I was just so intrigued. I forgot my role as the facilitator and I kept probing a little bit more. And then she well, finally, when she said, you don't like our answers? You know, and I just said, no, 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 I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking, wow, wow. You know, they, they, in terms of their understanding of what racism is, their embrace of multiple and intersecting identities, you know, all of those things. Now, millennials were a little bit more focused because, you know, um, 
there would be those like Eduardo um, Benilio Silva, who's a sociologist, and he's wrote the book Racism Without Racist, you know, which talks about, you know, the dynamics and the structures that are still in place. Um, he says that those Gen, Gen Z folks aren't tested yet. They haven't done the things like buy a house and go to, you know, in the work world and competition with all those, which would test to see whether or not you're, you're going to, um, you know, be in competition with that friend of a different race or think you're, you know, try to ride the white thing as Chris Rock calls it, you know, over on this. So we don't know, but there still is hope there. My, my, my millennials though did say, that they did have friends across racial lines, but when they wanted to go quick and deep, they went with their own. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I think Adele, did you have a question? Yes, yeah, just a quick question. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Deborah. That was wonderful. Uh, I just wanted to, to ask if you're also an advocate of romantic relationships. You mentioned dating briefly. Uh, and I can't help but think about interracial relationships and the potential to break down this racial divide between black and white more than any other form of interaction. Yeah. What is your stance on that? Thank you for that question. You know, because when, even from my editors, because this is the second book I've written on cross-racial friendship, they all wanted to know if I was going to do something around, um, you know, interracial marriages and, you know, and romantic relationships. And there was a lot that's been studied about those. And so I wasn't as interested in it, but I, what I did come up with, because I, you know, I had to please the editors, was the fact that, you know, um, that's my chapter I call two button choice. You know, that the way that our society is set up, that either you're gonna be acquaintances, you know, and tolerating, just get along, or you have to fall so deeply in love with this individual that you can um, become lovers so that you can abstain the racism and or the the context out of which that happens. So you do one or the other, and that's where generally that people fell into, you know. But friendships, you know, not so much. But I do think that romantic and interracial, you know, marriages and partnerships, etc., do um, give the best witness, and that's what I talk to to racial harmony and to um, how we can grow and love together. You know, if we had the marriage of, you know, um, interracial marriage of the United States or of the, you know, the world, wouldn't that be great? So yes, they're a great example, and they, but they also um, represent and reflect all the challenges and the benefits at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um. We might have another. Someone sent me a direct chat, but she didn't post the question. And Owen is raising his hand as well, I think. Owen. Okay, yeah. well, yeah, let's yeah, have Owen go I have, first. I have yeah. a question. Thank you. Dr. Fleming, this has been a great talk. I, I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, I had a couple of questions. One is that, I don't even know how to ask this exactly. You, you talked about uh, this feeling that you've kind of done all your teaching and everything. You've kind of, you've kind of done it. And... Um, I, I'm sure you had the experience of getting into relationships with uh, whites, primarily whites, and being the person in the room, that, that, let alone with your professional background and your research and so forth, just because you are black, you're the person in the room that when a racial question comes up, everybody looks to you. And uh, you know, they kind of expect you to make the first comment and that sort of thing. Um, and I just wonder, I, I'm finding that as I get older and older, I'm just kind of done playing that role. And I've been on so many diversity committees, and every town I've been in, every company I've worked, every you know, biz, uh, work uh, place I've been in, it's always been a diversity committee, and they kind of expect you to be part of it. So uh, anyway, and I, I just, I just find that after a while, it just gets to be tiresome. As you say, I think, um, I think people of color across the country have finally said. If they didn't before in the last few months, it's not my problem, it's your problem. And I'm just wondering how you advise maybe younger people coming along how to deal with that, uh, how to deal with that question. Uh, do you, you know, I mean, I, I think for myself, somehow I, I figure out a way to size up a person when I first meet them and figure out where they stand. And if I'm not sure, I guess it's a curiosity to find out, but I, I really tend to just kind of veer away from that, that place. 
and if it gets to be uncomfortable, then I'll just veer away from the veer away from the from the person altogether. I'm just, I'm just wondering what your comments would be on, on just answering that question. You know, and that is a great question, and it reflects the fact that we do have such an uneven experience, and that we still relate from that dominance model and not a relationship yeah. model, because that dominance model sets it up as you know um, that everyone who's a person of color becomes the expert and yeah. in, in racism and the lived experience, but they have lived experience, but that doesn't mean you're an expert. And we can't keep buying into that myth, you know, as people of color, that because we have lived experience that we understand racism or we understand the history, we don't, you know? I'm not saying mm -hmm. that we don't. We used to not want to say that because then that gave white people more proof. I'd say, hey, if they don't know it, I don't have to know it. But I still think <laughs> that's our work to do truly. And that's why people, you know, they don't, they don't say that. But I think we need to say it out loud right now. It's because we're living in such a populist culture where if my lived experience becomes reality, my lived experience becomes what I fight for. And, and you know, and, you know, and we're getting stuck on stupid with a lot of this stuff. And so what has, you know, I, 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 I think that, you know, for, um, you know, and then you, you're right, we have the minority tax in, in, um, in organizations. I had to sit on every single search committee because there wasn't, you know, somebody, you know, there, you know, and so you're supposed to do that plus everything and represent, and you often can't. So, um, and no race is monolithic, you know, not, right, not, right, not right. even white people, you know, not even white right, people, right. not even white you know. <laughs> You know, anyway, um, you know, so, you know, what we have to do, like I said, there's individual work we have to do on our own racial identity, and then when there's collective work we have to do, you know, and, and uh -huh. the excitement about now is that everyone can put themselves in a learning mode, and when, and when people of color, you know, think that they can just sit back now while whites catch up, you know, and start to learn about themselves <laughs> as a racial being, I say to them, oh, no, 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 because, you know, I have, like, when I do writing, there's, there's young, like even editors that write things like, you know, well, blacks can't be racist because this. And I say, oh, it's like, you know, I'll, I'll point them to some work and just say, I understand, but learn about, you know, interpersonal um, racism, or even just look, um, think about racism as any attitude or belief or practice, or when you're promoting practices or policies that benefit you know, um, whites, one race over another. In the United States, that's whites. So you, you can't tell me that Candace Owen, you know, I'm sorry, is not racist, you know? Mm -hmm. or, you, you know or you can't tell me that, you know, there are some people who are, you know, it, it, it's not tethered to your skin color. It isn't, mm -hmm. tethered, you know, mm -hmm. and if anything, mm -hmm. white people, I want people to know, you know, because there are some um, people out there, you know, who will tell you that white, if you're white, that you're inherently racist. If you're white, that that means that you are, you know, oppressor. And there are a lot of white people taking that in. Swallow. And I tell them, I talk about it, you know, in my, in my class, I'll say, why would you believe that? You know, why would you believe that there's no such thing as a, a positive white identity? Tell me about what that's about, you know, if it's not just white guilt. So, but strive to know what a you know to work on a positive white identity because it doesn't do me any good if you your relationship with me is to extract your you know your you dump your collective guilt on me and i extract my my self-worth from you what that's not a healthy dynamic who wants that kind of relationship you know, you know what I'm saying? That's great. Yes, so we, yes, we yeah. all have that's to funny. do our work and we all have to be fully authentic in who we are and you know work to eradicate racism you know it's, it's yeah. it it truly is and i've said this you know and i, I was glad when ivan kennedy put this in his book because he suffered you know he he was when he was diagnosed with cancer i've always in, um used the analogy that racism is like a cancerous tumor that's out there that grows you know and that affecting the quality of all of our lives mm -hmm. and so we all have mm -hmm. to work to be better anti-racist mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. thank you thank you okay. thank you Okay. Peg Howard has a question about um, education levels affecting cross-racial relationships. About education, I'm sorry? Um, it, it should like it. How different educational levels made a difference in how people formed friendships. There were a number of different things that, that contributed, but education, I didn't quite understand what you were saying about that. Uh, what, okay. How, okay. So if you would... 
yeah, that uh, across all educational levels, people did have friends that cross racial lines. But what we did is try to figure out what was the probability of, you know, what does it take for it to be easier to have a friend that's cross racial lines, you know? And it, if you were less educated, so like if you only had a high school education, then it took, you, you also had to share the same career, you know, or same like work setting. You had to have geographic, um, you know, proximity. You had to be close to them, you know, in the same circle. You had to share the same values and you had to share the same um, social class, like same, you know, making about the same kind of money. So all those factors had to line up before you could be a friend with somebody of a different race. If you had higher education, those who had college education and above, you know, all it took was similar values and the same social class. You know, now think about it. If you went to college with someone who was of a different race, you know, those friendships might have persisted. And it matter if you are, you know, I have friends who are white who live in California. We just visit each other. We just go because class, you know, and because we're of the same social class too, because we can afford to do that. Am I making sense? But we don't, um, you know, and I miss our similar values, you know, and social class. Those are the only two things you needed, you know, but you didn't need to be have geographic proximity, you know. You don't need to have the same career or same share occupation because those things don't matter. You know, making that makes that that help. Uh, yes, that's that's okay. that's very clear. Thank you. What about kids? What should we be doing with children to to help build the the attitudes and and understandings? Great, great question. I think um, one is role model. You know, so um, with multiracial living you know, and make that a norm, like, um, you know, who your friends are, but, you know, also where you choose to, to you know, um, vacation, where you occupy, you know, um, wh who's, you know, um, where you go for services, you know, um, and then what you say when you're, when you're listening to, um, like, media like the programs or the news etc because they're picking that up you know i don't know how many people would say you know my well my dad wasn't really racist but i used to hear him say this when this came on the you know the news you, you see what i'm saying so they're they're getting those messages they're getting those messages so what you say about things like that how you um i think is important you know, um, in terms of role modeling, and then talking honestly and openly about race and history, you know, and, you know, telling them about the civil rights movement, talking about, you know, um, George Floyd, I have Floyd, you know, I have um, friends who have taken their families to go to Montgomery, Alabama, to look at the, go see the lynching museum, you know, it's hard, you know, the kids are, if, when they're of a certain age, you know, um, but to take them on trips to, to show them an experience and, you know, or to DC to see the MLK monument or the Smith, you know, the African American Museum, the Smithsonian, and talk about these things with them. So make it just a part of the normal routine of just learning about life and, you know, and, and about that. I think the more that you can do those things and not have it like to be, shh, you know, like my, when I was growing up, it was like, you know, what, what you didn't even say the word black, you know. My, I always tell the story of my sister who was, um, his name is Nancy, and she worked actually for one time, and this was a place in Vermont, you know, so you guys would, so you, you know that they, they acted like they'd never seen black people before when she came in the door, you know, but she was doing a consulting gig with them. And so when people would come in and they would ask to see, something, there was two Nancys. One was white, of course, you know, <laughs> the one, you know the, the, the other one was my sister. But when they would come in, they would say, I'm here to see Nancy. Then the person would say, which one? And they would go, you know, and whisper it because it was like, you know, and so it got to be so much of a joke that they started calling her Black Nancy, you know, Black Nancy and White Nancy. So when they come, they would go, Black Nancy, and, you know, to the sugar, and the person would go, like this goes, oh, you know, <laughs> it's an identifier, you know, and in fact, they're still friends today. So we, you know, we always say, how's White Nancy doing, you know, <laughs> but, you know, we have to, you know, we, we come along, you just, just talk about it, you know, like sometimes people will say everything else about the individual, but they won't say black, 
you know, you know, or they're white, you know, yeah. or they're Hispanic. So okay. weave it in, just weave it in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On books too, you know, you can give kids what they're wonderful, you know, books, you know, out there now for kids that, you know, they don't have to, you know, the, the books I was going to, I'm trying to look onto my shelf because I buy them right now. One is Amazing Grace, you know, um, is a beautiful book, you know, um, about a black girl, um, Grace. And there are others that you can just, you know, that could be on their shelves, just like with everything else, you know. Um, uh, John and Marianne have been waiting patiently to ask a question. So I'm just diving in and making sure they get their turn. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it very much your comments and I just finished your book. I have friends who are, yes. I particularly, being a woman of faith myself, uh, I particularly like the chapter that you disclosed about joining the convent for 13 years. And it has really shaken me because the systemic racism is so much in the church. And that really is a foundation for me. I'm also the um, grandmother of a biracial nine-year-old boy and the mother-in-law of his biracial father. And uh, so I just wanted to reach out to you and hear anything you might have to say about, um, for me, it would be Christianity, but it, it really doesn't matter. It's just, I was so moved. It was so new for me to realize that the church is just as human as the rest of us. Yeah. So thank you for that. And even just thank you for you know, sharing your story that just, it just warmed my heart. It really did. You know, my first book on um, cross-racial friendships called Racing Across the Lines, Changing Race Relations Through Friendships. And it was, um, it's all on a, from a spiritual perspective. You know, in fact, you know, it was um, published by Pilgrim Press and they wanted me to, um, to write it from a spiritual perspective so that they could use it for their fellowships. It was right, around, and then I, um, they asked me to update, the second edition came out around the time of when Obama was first running and the whole thing with Reverend Jeremiah Wright, because that was the United Church of Christ and they were really pulling, to, you know, um, that, that really made it um, problematic for them. And I say that because in that book, I make more of the case that, you know, crossing racial, um, racial lines and friendships is, I believe, a spiritual act. Now, for many people, spiritual is wrapped in organized religion, and for many, it's not, you know, but it is a spiritual act in the sense that is transformative. You have to transform, you have to transcend. Remember, I was talking about that onion and coming out of your core of who you are, you know, core speaking to core, you know, that's fundamentally who we are, whether you believe that's God's children or what that's about. That's your, that's, if it comes out of faith or just a, a, a belief, a strong belief in humanity, core speaking to core is what it's about. So yes, it is a spiritual act. And, you know, I think there are some religious traditions that do a much better job of supporting and removing those obstacles, obstacles than others. You know, sadly, the faith tradition that I've grown up in and I'm still, now I call myself a um, anti-clerical, conscientious objector Catholic. You know, um, <laughs> and, if, and if you've read, um, and if you've read J um, James Carroll, Atlantic <laughs> article, you'll understand that. You know, because um, he he makes that case in there. But anyway, um, you know you know, they haven't done a good job of that at all about any, you know, in terms of differences. It's it's too much on power and greed, but that's another thing. But there are other faith traditions like the United Church of Christ and some others that have moved it forward in the Christian tradition. Now, I'm doing a lot of work now with, you know, with church faith um, communities on this. And I've titled the series like, you know, you know, that, that they all may be one, you know, in achieving racial Ra racial reconciliation and how we do that in terms of healing, you know, and, and you were, and, you know, the little known black history fact that I write about in the book was that I did, you know, I was a nun for seven, 13 years, you know, um, and in fact, some of my nun friends who are, you know, right, my, the ones that I'm so close to from uh, nun friends from my, the convent, you know, 
you know, they called me around the stuff and I tell them, like, you know, I just need a break from it. I can't even, I, you know, first of all, because of the representation of the thing in terms of Catholic and then the Catholic, you know, then community life and all of that, you know, we're going to meet the first time, like for over the weekend and do some social distancing visiting because they were so, <laughs> The, the light bulb was coming on for them, you know, and I have also been more honest because about how, what that experience was like for me, you know, and the racism that was part of the church, very much a part of the church. It still is in many, in many ways. Thank, so you. thank you for that. Welcome. Are there any other questions? Owen? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Could, could I ask one more, please? I, I don't want to tie you up completely, Dr. Plummer, but I'm just curious. This isn't really what you're talking about tonight, but you, obviously, you know, you're a person of learning, a person who thinks a lot, and I'm just, I'm just wondering what you think about the statues situation, and not, not Nathan Bedford Forrest statue or you know Robert E. Lee or something like. What do you think about Washington statue and uh, or uh, Jefferson statues? Or they're talking now about taking Jefferson out of the Jefferson Memorial and putting, um, um, I forget who they want to put in there. Um, uh, but anyway, um, you know, what, what, what do you think about that situation? I'm just curious. Yeah, I, um, I'm a big fan. You don't mind fan. my asking. Yeah, I don't. Because I'm a big fan of, of removing them, but putting them in museums or places where they could continue to educate. I think it'd be a lost opportunity if we just got rid of them and tried to bury them and pretend as if, these things, you know, run a part of our history. Mm -hmm. I think in public places, though, because they they don't represent the best of our history, and they also are um, triggers and mm -hmm. um, symbols for continued racism. But I don't think I think every single one of them should be put either into a museum or a place where we can have the opportunity to talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I'm a big fan of the organization Facing History in Ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. I still serve on the New England Advisory Board. You know, I'm chairing that because it is about how do we face history in ourselves. You know, people make choices and choices make history. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and if we don't learn about that history, you know, um, you know, we don't, you know, and the, like right. even the Confederate flag, you know, right. and what that yeah. stands for, all yeah. of those things, you know, um, yeah. I had a yeah. wonderful civil rights study tour with them. The last one was in 2017, you know, where we crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge and learned about, you know, those and, and you know, learned about all of that history behind that. And, you know, we're not getting it in our classroom, so we have to create our own classrooms. And, right. and I think that those statues would be really good um, ways to start to do that, you know, mm -hmm, but not mm -hmm, in public mm -hmm. places. I don't think they mm -hmm. should be in public places. And people should know, like the Edmund Pettus Bridge, why would you call a name of, you know, an Alabama, you know, KKK heads, mm -hmm. headsman, mm -hmm. you know, who mm -hmm. was also a bigot, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John Lewis, you know, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. very much, you know, in, in, in support of that, encouraging people to do that. I just read actually in the paper yesterday that, um, that's been something that's been on the table for some time. And um, Congressman Lewis said he didn't want it named after himself. He wants it to stay the Evan Pettus Bridge to stimulate conversation about who that person was and what, and what he meant to um, uh, what he meant to their society and so forth, which, which I thought was interesting and yeah. typical of John Lewis, uh, yeah, all right. a man and of humility. Yeah. Gone, yeah, I think it's been yeah. much better served if it was named after him and then they asked yeah. about why, why. And then you get the history of Edmund Pettus. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, because yeah, I think yeah. that's what history is about. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. Wow, well, this has been wonderful. And Debbie, because I know you like to be called Debbie, so it's, it's just been wonderful. I think everyone's enjoyed it so much and, and learned a lot. And I, uh, before everybody goes, I just want to give you uh, Debbie's uh, website is dlplumber, that's all one word, dot com. And she has a blog and there's a lot of information. And I just noticed the picture that you have with the other two women was uh, the black and white women in conversation event that you had at UMass Medical and in Boston last year. And that's where I met you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, that was, so, it was from there. Yeah, that was with because Eve Bridberg yeah, and, um, and Kelly Cross Lee. Yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, it was great. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It was. So, um, yeah, and then uh, your book again is Some of My Friends Are dot dot dot. 
and again, so much information on your website. So thank, thank you. you so much. We thank really you. appreciate it. I, I really appreciate this too. And as I said, you know, to tell people, please, you know, buy the book, encourage other friends to buy the book. You don't have to even read it. You just have to put it on your table or something because it sparks conversation. <laughs> we'll do that. So thank you for that. <laughs> appreciate that. Did Let's you have, have Leslie, did you want to say something? I just... Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I know we're trying to exit here, but I just wanted to say, I think one of the stories, I mean, I represent privilege in so many different ways, being a administrator of a private school here on the North Shore, about north of Boston, being white, being in a neighborhood that's primarily white, all the things. I probably could tick off almost everything in the list, but, you know, one of the things that we all strive for, at least in our missions up here, and we say is diversity within our school systems, and, and if we really take a harder look at at how that's happening, it's mostly through adoption. And, um, you know, and, and that's a whole other issue. I'm sure that you have wonderful um, thoughts about that I'd love to hear, but one of the stories that always um, just strikes home with me is one that involved my son. He was a kindergartner, maybe even a four-year-old at the time, and his older partner that day, because we're a multi-age uh, multi classroom, and his older partner that day, and he's, he's, he's my biological son, so you can imagine what he looks like. Um, along with my white husband, and uh, <laughs> he's a Norman Rockwell kind of painting guy, kind of guy. And uh, you know, he said he he his older partner that day was a guy named Will, about an eighth grader who was about six one at the time, as black as 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 skin as I've ever seen. And he said he came home one day and he said, "Mom," he said, "I think Will and I are twins." And I thought, hmm. <laughs> okay, you know, in my own, you know, obviously my history and my own every experiences. And I said, well, why do you think that, James? And he goes, he, we were both wearing a white t-shirt and jeans. <laughs> and I thought, isn't that what we want to get to? And I just thought that was a really nice way to think um, exactly. of, of, of everything you've said today and, yeah. and what we're striving for. So thank and you. I, uh, and it's so true because one of the things and who was that peg that asked about kids too that um you know what we tended to do you know was to pass on um information or even um support and and skills to our children which at one point in our history was very adaptive you know don't say this don't do this you know think about it, don't talk about it, you know don't talk about it like this don't talk about race don't say this you know and for um for people of color it was you know um, white people will do this so don't trust this you know because if you didn't you felt like you were sending your kids like out in sub degree zero weather without a coat you know because you were socializing them to that and that was very adaptive in the 70s and the 80s, et cetera. But now it's really maladaptive, you know? So one thing we really can do is start to speak our truths to, you know, to kids. And when they say things like even about, are all cops bad? I say, no, they're not, you know, they're not cops bad. But, you know, we do have a problem in our nation, you know, where, where some, you know, cops have brought some racist attitudes to you know, to their work. And we got to make sure that we weed them out, you know, have those honest conversations so that they grow up not being fearful or not, you know, and having a more nuanced and, and um, you know, layered understanding of race. We, we tend to kill that, you know. Well, I think on that note, uh, Deborah, we've kept you long enough, but, uh, and I hate to put you on the spot, but will you promise to join us again sometime? <laughs> <laughs> no, I love these conversations. I really do. And, you know, I could be here to November, you know, um, you know, um, um, having them, especially with people like you who are, you know, um, you know, so uh, attentive. And like I said, you're pulling with me, you know, so you give me, you give me courage, you know, you're like, with many, so when uh, you know, I don't have to be. I can see you. I can experience that happening, you know. And I and I and I really appreciate that. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us, and have a good night.